and, and I, I assume you do it on your end as well, but on, on our end, when someone who is interested in acquiring somebody who's raising financing, we actually do an analysis on what does the founder get? What does the founder get owning 78% of the company today versus after raising money, what kind of valuation he has to achieve to get the same amount of cash? And it often happens to be four or five times more than what you have to do. Um, so, Matt, what you were saying about um, just running out of the seed money, it's interesting to think about that. A lot of the teams that we work with um, will be the first money in. They'll move to Shenzhen and develop their product with us for three to six months, sometimes take to a year to finish their product. They'll move here, start to uh, pitch next round VCs, develop customers, work on their operations and production capabilities. And at that point, you're about 18 months, two years. So that kind of gets to the question, um, it sounds like from a startup perspective, there's no bad time to start developing relationships. Oh no, there is a bad time. And that's that's <laughs> right before you're out of money, right? That's a super bad time to try to do this, right? So honestly, the best time is, I'm not joking, now. Now, 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 do it now, right? Uh, do it from the moment you are building this thing. And, and by the way, it's just the process. Like, right now, figure out five companies were elected by. And right now, figure out five businesses inside those companies that are most likely to be interested. And right now, figure out who runs those businesses. And right now, follow them on Twitter. And right now, link in with them. Right now, reach out. Because those five people or their replacements are going to be the like next ones. It's not hard. And then you do the same thing I would do with everything else. Is you figure out who their friends are, you back them. Like, you basically do everything you can to be like, I have a really good understanding of who this person is and how they think. And when I meet them, they're going to look at me and go, where have you been, my boy? Right? And they're going to go, wow, this is entirely certain. This is so coincidental that we met each other. And you're going to go, good thing I did all that. Okay? If you're lucky. And again, you have probability, and you five or ten of those, and a couple of them might pan out, and a couple of them are in the right place in two years. So there you go. So my point is, is this is not some mystery. And this is not something which you do by accident. It is highly intentional. Now, plan A as an entrepreneur is build a massive company. And guess what? If you build a massive company and you're massively successful and you're not going to be an early exit, that's fine. Rock and roll. You will not have wasted your time building these relationships, right? But chances are you're not going to build a massive company. Chances are, you know, none of us are going to do the next Google, right? Chances are we're going to be looking for exit opportunities along the way, and then you will be way ahead of the game because you've laid the groundwork on that, right? And, you know, we, sit, we enjoy the shade today because someone 100 years ago chose to plant a tree. Start planting trees now. I would love to ask another kind of technical question, drilling really into what you just said, Matt. Um, and to kick it off, who here has made a cold call before? Any kind of cold call? Email, telephone, the worst possible type. Okay. And we all know the hell of telephone cold calls. Um, for the introverts out there, so for the people who are not comfortable um, walking up to somebody at a conference and telling them how great the product is, or uh, who you know have a great idea and have a lot of confidence in the product, but just you know they haven't had to make cold calls before. What would you what would you advise to those people in, in this process? We've we've had teams take on advisors who can kind of help them. What would you say is a good tactic? Um, I always come back to be it's really it's, again it's, we overthink this stuff. It's like figure out what the other person wants and give it to them. Okay, so so Cisco, right? Big monster company. Pretty slow to get stuff up. Yeah. So what does Cisco generally want when it tries to acquire a company? It wants velocity. It wants speed. So if you're going to try to meet someone at Cisco, probably the first thing you should lead with is we're moving really fast. Right? It's not hard. Right? You could be an introvert or extrovert, but that message is really, really clear. Right? And, and again, with every single company, it's going to be different. But just be really straightforward. Now, we're scared about saying the wrong thing. We're scared about being judged. Guess what? That's what happens. You get judged. We all judge each other constantly, right? Um, so get over it, right? Put your ego in the back seat. Get used to being judged. Get used to, um, you know, being embarrassed. Um, but realize that uh, by having a plan going in, it's a lot, you're a lot more likely to be successful. And you can overcome some of those voices in the back of your head that are telling you you're not good enough. Um, my advice, by the way, is most of the time live stuff is hard. You know, Twitter's very easy, LinkedIn's very easy. Um, and do something relevant, right? Um, you know, right now, if you were to say, blah, 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 blockchain, blah, 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 you'll get a lot of responses. 
right? And, and that's just reality. Blah, 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 AI, PhD, blah, 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 gets a lot of responses. Blah, 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 blah self-driving car, blah, 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 right? Blah, 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 rent scooters, blah, 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 right? If you're saying, yeah, I'm building developer tools for parsley replacements, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get a lot of responses. Right? It's hard. There's not a lot of people shopping for parsley replacements. So at the end of the day, like, be relevant and get out there. So anyways, my advice is just um, power through and, uh, and be direct. Or one, two. Yeah. Just on, on what you guys are saying about, um, you know, creating these, like, collisions with potential buyers and identifying the right people, let's say we have some of those people identified. What do those touch points look like? It's like, hey, we're trying to, like, collaborate in the future. You know, how do you meet that person at the conference? What do you do? Like, how do you engage them over quarters, over months? Is it keep them with like, the investor update type stuff? Is it, you know, checking in to see kind of what's going on? Like, what do, you know, it's not like they're going to buy you right now. But there might not be any immediate collaboration. You know? I mean, generally when you're dating, what are you interested in? Like, no need to be quiet about it, right? Like, hey, we want to build a relationship over time. Right? Like, everybody knows what's going on. <laughs> it's not, why do you start to work with a big company like Cisco? Uh, uh, I mean, yes, right? Like, it's, it's no secret. So, and, and by the way, hey, nice to meet you. I want you to buy me. It's not a great thing. But hey, we're doing relevant work. We'd like to build a relationship over time. We'd like to demonstrate to you what we're building, right? What we're doing, how it's relevant. That's great, right? And, and again, it's all the ways that you as a startup can hustle and do work that adds value to the potential acquirers. Now, I like to think of this as highly asymmetrical, because the acquiring companies have money and you don't. That's it. Buy or sell, right? Very, very simple. Play all these mental games and try to convolute that, but at the end of the day, one party has dollars, one party has equity, and that's it. And so, guess what? If you're the party that doesn't have the dollars, you do the hard work. I'd love to actually hear uh, two from you. Just the, is there an example of a team who's done this really, really well? This like dating process where you've seen a team just nail it, and they've done all the right updates, they've done the right whatever. How do they do it? Um, not to not to pick a yeah. team. No, I I, I I would say it's hard. I mean, there's probably pieces of pieces, and but not like the full process. But there's certain pieces, like for example. I mean, for us, if you actually reach out through someone else who has a relationship, it's always helpful. Like right? if, um, if I get an email from Cyril, I don't know, and you know, and he'll say, "Hey, we, we've seen this really great startup. I think that's what you guys might be looking for. I think it makes sense for you guys to meet." It, it's actually then the first money I am like, we actually want to just take the, to take the call and have a conversation, have a meeting, and really that that we understand the product. I think that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, I mean, I think. At least for us, like developing relationships, I think that, that's, that's, that's a good approach. I, I think another one that works um, is you know, you're looking for help. You're in a related area, and I just want some help and advice. Can you put me with maybe people who are in a like I actually had a startup, um, like something to be called sort of Whistle, and he said, Look, we're really looking at this very interesting technology, and I'm just looking to connect with some engineers who understand like the connectivity to the iPhone. And so, I mean, it's usually in those, and then, and then all of a sudden they, relation, they develop a relationship with me, they, they develop a relationship with head of engineering, they develop a relationship with other engineers in the company. So I think usually those tactics really work because you come off as humble, you come off as respectful, you actually have expertise that I don't, you might have a relationship that I don't, and people are always wanting and willing to help. So I think that that's really important. Um, so, yeah, so those are some of the remote example of, I guess, how things. Another thing that I, actually, I have an example on the other end, like I had it earlier today, earlier this week, I had a call with a startup, and they actually have an interesting solution that could fit some of our experiences we create, but it took me 20 minutes to understand how we could potentially leverage it. It's because sometimes when you, and we're a consumer, we're a consumer product company, so obviously we focus more about consumer experiences and solutions that we, we create for consumers. And typically, when you talk to somebody in group dev, or if you talk to a CEO, a CFO, you know, we understand our businesses, but obviously we're not at the technical level like you would have like, talking to engineers. So this person is describing to me like 
encoding, compression, and so I'm and I'm just trying to understand because for me, I'm just trying to understand like what kind of experience, what kind of consumer experience can you help us create? And so I kept like trying to probe different angles, and then I was like, okay, so you're saying you can actually make streaming a lot easier by games for gamers? Okay, I get that, but sometimes people may not have the patience to like really dig in and understand your technology. So you have to make sure that you make your pitch maybe at like like Matt was saying, you have to understand what they want, right? So from my perspective, I'm not super technical, so you can actually pitch to me. We can create a business for you streaming out of box. You know, like if they're interested in gaming, we can we can come up and then maybe then break it down in more detail. But if you start at the bottom of the core technology, it takes a while to actually get up and see, okay, I get it. This is the type of business we can create. I like that thing that you did, yeah, thinking what Matt was saying, figure out the problem that that like, corporate might have and solve it. So for you, if it's consumer experiences, how do you frame your pitch in a way that's going to be spot on with what that buyer's looking for? I mean, even internally, I would say, we try to think, like, what would our press release look like when we do an acquisition? So I think as a startup, if you can come up and tell us, like, I can I can create this type of solution where logic is going to come out and out, so we're going to have, you know, streaming out of a box, whatever, and, you know, set up a stream in five minutes or something like that. That's obviously a lot more digestible than you're like, okay, tell me more about it. So. A couple of good points for Natasha. One is be easy to help. You know, when, when, when rich VCs get together, or when they get together with their friends, do you think they talk about how much money they just made? Like, no, they don't talk about that at all. They talk about all the people they helped out and how nice people they are. Right? So be easy to help. This is a Wall Street. Exactly. And so, so, at the end of the day, like, people want to say this little company came in and they were doing interesting stuff and they had a question about this and I hooked them up here and it really changed them and I hope they're super successful because it makes them look good. Right? It's great. Just be easy to help. Right? Um, uh, to all this stuff, everyone's doing interesting work. The challenge for a large corporate is you have a billion priorities and you can only do the top two or three. So it's not enough to be interesting or relevant to a big company, you've got to be one of the top two or three priorities, right? That's the only way they'll devote any attention to. The question is, how do you figure out that the top two or three priorities of a large organization? It's a huge complex social systems. Start with a super obvious place. I've always recommended this to people. Notice it really the earnings come. Always listen to earnings call. Actually, read the transcripts. It's better than listening, but, but do both. And the reason why is earnings call are highly orchestrated affairs where every word of the prepared remarks have been carefully vetted by everybody. So you can basically take every, any piece of that to the bank. Otherwise, they wouldn't put it in the earnings call. Right? So if you were to listen to, say, a Cisco's earnings call, you would hear a lot about our transformation from perpetual hardware-based licensing to recurring software-based subscriptions. It's right there, right? So if you were going to approach someone at Cisco, you probably want to say, hey, I can help you in your transformation to a software subscription-based revenue business. Right away, you know you're being relevant. Right? It's not that hard, right? Conversely, if you're not aligned, or you say something which is, again, you're going to We'll get an ambivalent, no, this final thing I'll say this is, there's only two answers in this one, but this is true of VC and everything else. Fuck yes, and everything else. <laughs> there's a whole lot of ways that people say something other than fuck yes, but it all means the same thing, which is you're not there. And when someone, you're really relevant to somebody, they're really excited about it, it's not ambiguous, it's not wondering, it's not curious, right? Um, and so, be that organization, be that company that elicits that enthusiastic hell yeah response. Tweet the hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> you really get that though. There's very little advantage to a corp dev guy to keep this strong. There's very little, like, because all that does is shut down future conversations. So, let's say all sorts of things other than that, because all of this is not in their best interest, right? I'll say on a point that uh, Natasha you touched on a little bit earlier, a trick that a lot of our startups use to get great meetings is asking for advice. And that works almost every time. People in university love helping startups. Um, I'm pretty sure that's how Claire almost got their entire early board, was just asking for help. But in better stories, it's very possible to say, um, hey, you know what, I know you did this before, I saw this on LinkedIn, can I take you to lunch? I would love to understand how you built this market or how you put together everything you pitch up, whatever it is. Because that makes people feel like experts and love that. And that's a, it's a great time to do it. works every time. Um, okay, so getting tactical again. 
Uh, I'd love to talk about how price is determined. Um, and this question comes up a lot from the VC perspective as well. How do you figure out what to raise, what your valuation is? A lot of the times it's predetermined by all sorts of outside factors, but from a uh, corporate development perspective, um, and maybe uh, you can kick us off, Matt, um, how was your price determined when you got to uh, um, long story, but the, the value starts at the bottom, which is people. Um, Cisco doesn't acquire two-person startups, just doesn't have the, the energy to do it, so you need a minimum number of people. Okay? And then it builds from there to technology, technology that we can incorporate into other products that are, will then be better in the market, to products. We can take their product and bring it to market through our sales channels and get value out of it to a, a channel, hey, this company has existing rocks in the market that our other products can go through and get money out of it, which is hard for a big company like Cisco because we would have pretty great products in the market. And then finally, a full business if we're buying the whole thing. Um, and those are the biggest acquisitions. And so as you go up, you get the least money if you're just smart people. You get more money if you're smart people plus good technology. You get more money if you're a full-fledged product that can be sold as is. You get it and so on. Um, the, the startups that Cisco acquires, the low end of that is probably 10 to 12 billion bucks. I mean, it's hard for Cisco to do anything smaller than that. Um, to the largest, which are multi billion dollar acquisitions. The big one we did recently was App Dynamics. It was a $3.6 billion deal that we bought the day before they went public. It's crazy, right? But you can imagine that's a full fledged business, right? And the only interesting reason why that happened. But, um, uh, that's sort of how it goes. Uh, once you get into a buying decision, more is better. More people are better. More product, more technology is better. More patents are better. More products are better, right? So if you're a one-man band with a little bit of stuff and no IP protection, it's hard to prove that you have a lot of value. And the reason why for that, by the way, is they go, great idea, we're just going to work something. Somehow. So at the end of the day, your energy spent in is generally viewed as a pretty flat commodity in this space. Just some big numbers. I guess from our perspective, um, it's, it's, we've done acquisitions anywhere from sub, I wouldn't say 100,000 essentially, to uh, 400 million. So it's, we, don't, we haven't done it in our years. But, so it's, it's, really, it's really a combination of acquisitions, it's a revenue generating business. Um, revenue multiples typically the first two we use we, we as uh, what is the reasonable revenue multiple for this type of thing. So, and just to give you a perspective, large that we still trade, our range is also big. There was a, there was a panel who we were trading at 0.6 revenue, I think now we're trading at 2.7 revenue. So it's, it's funny because in the past, we would use a new change to be like, well, we're trading at like less than one time, so why would I pay you more? Now people are like, well, but you're trading at two and a half times, why are you offering me one and a half times? So, <laughs> So it, it, but you have to, so it's not always, you know, it's not always that precise. But I think for revenue generating business and revenue multiples, where we typically go, assuming that all these kind of hardware margins are about the same, or we can bring them out the um, And then when it comes down to, besides that, it's really, um, if it's a technology in the beginning, like software or technology that we plug in into another product, I think that in those situations, it's, um, it's, it's, I would say we'll look at our packs, we'll look how long it takes. So there's a little bit of like, how, how long would it take for us to develop this? How big of a team would we need to create something on our own? How much time? So it's really a combination of those factors. But for large second weeks, it tends to be like a few million dollars to get the tax composition. We're talking about the technology and beauty. Um, and again, the kind of business is kind of working based. And then we haven't really done the active hires. So we have a look at the number of active hires. And I think those have been. Those have been challenging in general because you, you are typically able to hire those people. So if, if somebody's going to an active hire nowadays, most likely those people are going to be available to hire. So, so we have kind of a look at what we have in that. Just, just sort of expanding on that, but uh, uh, are you going to get sued right now? The, the, the likelihood of doing this audience is almost 0% chance that you get sued, and the reason why is because you have no resources. It doesn't matter if you're infringing, it doesn't matter if you're doing things that you should be doing. Nobody sues somebody that doesn't have any resources because there's no model. And guess what? As soon as you get acquired, 
you're now part of a large corporate entity that has very large resources, and your likelihood of getting sued increases astronomically. So a big part of the M&A process is assumption of liability by the acquiring company. So guess what? Having all your stuff in order right now makes a ton of sense. Right? Um, and you'd be amazed at how the little, little, little stuff can become really material uh, once you get into a, an agreement. And so this is another thing I talk to companies about all the time is it really pays dividends to manage all the little details today, like clean laptops, like separate logins, like non-entangled IP with your existing employer, because um, that's stuff that will come up in a forensic audit down the line. Super careful use of open source code, super careful incorporation of that. File your provisional patents today. Get that time clock going on that. Not because your patents will be worth anything, because you'll have a little bit of defensive protection down the line. Because nothing shuts a deal down like we could spend 10 million bucks on a start that will expose us to a billion dollar loss. Very easy done, right? And and those things happen surprisingly often. Oh, some patent holder goes, Cisco just bought this thing, let me go through my portfolio and figure out what pay it through. And let me go to Cisco. Because you know Cisco just gonna settle. And for virt virtually no effort, I can get a few million bucks. That's the world we live in, unfortunately. It's crazy, but it's true. So um, take care of this stuff now. It's a bummer because it costs time and money. It doesn't really add value, but it will protect you down the line if you ever get that situation. And Matt, that is a perfect kickoff to my next question, which is around um, red flags during the negotiation process. Um, and if we're kind of comparing all this to a relationship again, I think you find out maybe when you see that prenup for the first time <laughs> that perhaps there's more things to work out than you realize. And I think you start to see people's true colors um, when negotiation starts. So I'd love to know for both of you, what are some red flags you've seen? How can the teams help avoid those? Um, I mean, typically if a, I mean, a big red flag is someone who's doing well and all of a sudden they're stuff. That's, that's usually a red flag for us. It's like, what's going on? Is there, is there a tech issue? Is there a technology issue? Is there a potential legal issue? So typically, so, so I think, and that's why it's important, it's another point for why it's important to keep a relationship, so that when a buyer gets a call or a potential buyer that we go for sale, it's not like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with this business? So, um, so then they can actually understand why all of a sudden something's for sale. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard because I think for at least in our world, like red flags came from multiple areas, you know, like in, in our space, like somebody just, Unfortunately, when you start out in the hardware space, you don't have the diversification um, option like Logitech does. So oftentimes, it's you launch one wrong file and it just, it just files down in terms of liability and inventory out of control. All of a sudden, channel inventory is flooding in. So we've had a lot of those situations when we've done acquisitions. We've had a situation of a like, legal problem that they were trying to crush under the rugs and kind of look out why are they not talking about it. When, when buyer asks you questions, you should be able to answer all of them. When you say, well, I don't know, I'm not sure, that's when it's kind of like, okay, they need to hide something or we need to spend more time. Um, I think, uh, I mean, oftentimes you also see kind of, um, I mean, I actually respect uh, startups that have a very good relationship with investors as well. Like, during negotiation, they actually are concerned about making sure that the investors are treated fairly and the process is structured well. Because again, when a founder starts negotiating on his own behalf and may not be representing investors fairly, that's another red flag. Like, what is going on there? What, what are they not disclosing about? You know, the situation of the company. Um, I, I guess it's just you know, the fear. yeah. I mean, I think being being upfront about issues that we know is probably the best thing. Because one one way or another, it's going to come out. And at that point, if you have if you have not disclosed something, we find on our own, then everything just becomes scrutiny, and it just makes the process more difficult. Yeah. And it's probably fair to say every startup's got some issues, right? So the more that you yeah, it's, it's communicate, it's very those. normal. Yeah, and for us, it could be financial, it could be team dynamics, it could be um, legal, and I mean, we kind of. We, we do as a company have a lot of issues with it, and every one of our businesses is understandable. I think the most important thing is to build trust that if there's an issue, just bring it up and uh, try to figure out and solve it. Then. Because if, if someone is actually engaging with you in negotiation, there's not interest that the buyer should be willing to spend time on, you know, on trying to figure out. I, I 
Yeah, it all comes out of trust. Generally, so so just imagine how many companies have ever sold in your career? I guess it's between zero and one for everybody in the audience, right? And you're going to be dealing with a corp debt person who does multiple deals per year, maybe multiple deals per quarter. So you're at an asymmetrical disadvantage, right? And, and it's easy to overthink it and play games and counter and back and forth. But, and my advice is always just be direct. Like, hey, that's not going to work. This is what we're looking for, right? This is why. Um, because it just dramatically reduces the likelihood that something gets misinterpreted as a signal of being untrustworthy. Right? Um, founders who are explicitly selfish, right? um, you know that they're being explicitly selfish in other parts of the negotiation as well. Like they will withhold information that they think might be damaging. Right? So you're looking for folks who are going to be straight shooters, straight dealers, right? It's not like being honest to a fault. It's not about being completely transparent. It's about um, being direct and being responsive. And um, again, all the things that, that Bill trumps. Uh, negotiations can be difficult. Negotiations can be emotional. Um, that's part of the process. But again, it's going to come down to a pretty rational business decision on the other end. Um, it's the world to you. When you're in the world trying to sell your business, it's like everything. It's the only thing you can think about. On the other end, it's just another day at the office. Right? One more series of emails, one more thing, one more project, one more folder inside of a folder, inside of a folder, inside of a folder. Okay. Um, and so, again, just be empathetic to the folks on the other end and be easy to work with. Because right? at the end of the day, if you're getting the ass to work with, they won't work with you. And you need the other side to want to hammer a deal through, power through. So, anyway, just a bunch of, of high level stuff. Um, uh, I'm trying to think about specifics. Like any obvious, we talk about this, audience avoidance behavior is generally a red flag. Like, oh, I don't really want to show you what we're building. Red flag. Or I don't really want you to meet the team. Red flag. Or, you know, we're not really cool about you inspecting our source code. Red flag. Right? Like, it's all going to get exposed. It's all going to be out there. So the sooner you get it, you know, the sooner you're able to. To, to invite people in and be receptive to work together, the better off you're going to be. I've seen that from our perspective um, in BC and in the accelerator world, when people are really cagey about showing you their product, yeah. well, you know, sign these eight forms, and, you know, we have to do this at our office. Like, okay, next, I'm sure you know, there's 10,000 things out there, and you don't have time to really dig in if it's going to be a cagey situation. Yeah, I mean, there's a great blog post out there, you know, ideas are an execution multiplier. So a great idea times zero execution is worth zero. Right? It's not to say it's a great idea, it's just not any, it's not any value. So uh, at the end of the day, being forthright about what it is you have is being forthright about your degree of execution. Um, and again, there's, there's some mystery about there's large companies that can be predatory this way that will dangle m &A to steal your ideas. Uh, there are a few out there who do that, but it's pretty easy to detect what that is and don't engage with there's a thing called Google, right? And, and so, like, again, if you're out there, there are companies that you can find plenty of examples of, hey, this company invited us in for this purpose, and all they were doing is collecting competitors, right? Um, uh, so, anyways, that's, that's and, and again, they change over time. Um, some companies used to do this one they do today. The dot of the internet and the dot of being able to share this stuff has created more good behavior than bad behavior. All right, so my last kind of topic before we kind of open up for questions and answers is inevitably what happens after the transaction. So it's day, it's day one, the founders have been, the, the bank is cleared, everything's happened, the team shows up at the headquarters or they come back to their old office, whatever the decision is, and what's it like next? What's it like on the other side? Um, well, we don't. Check out. <laughs> no, well, not not completely. I mean, being part of the program is actually to uh, stay close to the company. We have to continue for the progress and acquisition to the management of the board. Um, I mean, it, it depends on the acquisition. I, I mean, it, it, we we typically tend to be very transparent in terms of what our intentions are with the team, and we tend to be pretty transparent about developing the integration plan together with the leaders of the business to acquire. And we actually went as far as um, in the case of Jaybird, for example. 
Jaybird, we acquired two years ago, they, they were based in Salt Lake City. They had all of the operations uh, with warehouse and stuff in Salt Lake City. We're a global company. So we knew the minute we wanted to keep them global, that the warehouse is to be kind of sense. So um, we actually decided on day one of the announcement to tell people that the operations are going to be moving or integrated for the large tech operation. And we told people we're going to do this over time. Everyone here is going to have to, even if you lose your job, you're going to have to six months of them. I think because we've debated, like, do you just come in and be like, everything's going to be great, even if you just the way you are? But I think no one, ultimately, many people probably understand that once you sold, it's, it's, there's going to be parts that are integrated. The reason we acquire companies is because it's a synergy. So we actually chose to be very upfront and they want to highlight to people what areas we will integrate and what areas we won't touch, but you know, we'll continue to discuss in that way. So, um, and yeah, but I think like it depends on the business. In the case of Astro, Astro is a, is a brand, it's a product development organization that's here in San Francisco and they need to put them in half and we have the entire Astro team here in San Francisco. They work in just the way they used to do as part of another company. So it, 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 it varies. It, 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 it's fair to say a founder would have a point of view on that before the acquisition was finalized. Like, what yeah. the plan might look like, how about that affect the team? Yeah. In case of Rebels, we had founders in Montreal. They had family that they would have to relocate, and we actually agreed to give them a. And we are talking about three people, so we didn't want to have three people in Montreal. We wanted them to be here in the area. But we said, look, we'll give you eight months to figure out where you're going to live, how you're going to relocate with your family. So that's what we agreed on. Um, uh, the honest answer is it depends. Um, the bigger the acquisition, the more complex the integration. I mean, Cisco has like a twenty-five billion dollars supply chain, and so you know integrating with all of that in order systems is if you're a bigger entity. So the, the bigger the value, the more, the bigger the purchase price, the more involved in the integration of the organization. Uh, let me let me be honest with you though. So as a founder. Um, I always tell that you know startups in our society are glamorized, but you guys already know it's not a very glamorous existence. It's basically an anxiety fuel crunch, right? <laughs> and if you're lucky, you'll have moments of euphoria followed immediately by object care. That is the life of a startup. Um, guess what? You get acquired, and, and having done it, you feel like you get float out of that. It is, it is a magical feel because literally, with the swipe of a pen, all of your anxiety does. And the weight of this whole thing we've been carrying around, it's not a problem with it. Right? And it's, it really is amazing. And honestly, it is like, honestly, I felt like I, I could fly. It was so great. And by the way, you're either an entrepreneur or you're an entrepreneur who sold your company, right? You guys know me as the guy who sold my company in the system. I'm still the same person I was before, but you check that box and suddenly it you know, changes your whole uh, reputation and outcome, right? which is amazing. Except the thing you don't understand and that you don't appreciate as a startup founder is you have a life with very little frustration. Meaning, if you want to get something done, you just do it. Right? There's no one else, there's nothing else, you just say, we're going to do this, 